It's about this murder, this double murder on Aldershot Common. I met a man tonight in a pub who got very, very drunk and started rambling on about this murder. He seemed to know a lot about this murder and kept saying how sorry he was and that he'd done it. I only know that he lives at, at well, have you got a pencil? He lives local at 10 York Road. The tip-off about the motiveless murder of two women on Aldershot Common came within hours of the crime. It was almost two weeks before detectives acting on the call made contact with the local man accused in it. Can I have a name, please, sir? It was more than a year before they decided to arrest him. And even then, they didn't believe his incoherent confession and let him go. But today, that man is entering the 10th year of a life sentence for a double murder. On three separate days, Peter Fell rang the police to incriminate himself. It's hardly the action of an innocent man, but then it's hardly the action of a guilty one. We don't believe him guilty any more than some of the police seem to have done. The astonishing thing is that the jury did. Dawn was still breaking as Britain's biggest single troop embarkation since the war got underway. 600 Welsh guards were the first up the gangway, and such was the scale of the exercise that some four hours later, men were still queuing to come aboard. It was that strange spring 11 years ago, when Argentina laid claim to some half-forgotten islands in the South Atlantic, and Britain, to its own bewilderment, found itself on a war footing. It is a government's objective to see that the islands are free from occupation and are returned to British administration at the earliest possible moment. Even in peacetime, Aldershot in Hampshire, the home of the British Army, is a town in a permanent state of military alert. But in May 1982, there was a new urgency in the army's activity on these acres of sand, gorse and heathland on the edge of town. On May the 10th, this trainee platoon was undergoing the gruelling endurance test that would qualify the survivors for a Paris beret. A BBC television crew was filming the ordeal at a place called Hungry Hill. The common is army land, but it's always served civilian Aldershot as a place to walk, a place to exercise the dogs. That's what Margaret Johnson and Anne Lee were doing, as they often did, on that same afternoon, May the 10th. They'd spent an hour or so with their dogs, Monty and Tara, walking round Hungry Hill, within earshot of the para platoon. But at three o'clock on that bright May afternoon, they were just seconds away from death. As they coaxed the dogs down a leafy path, a hundred yards or less from a main road, both of them were to be stabbed to death in a sudden and vicious attack. Their bodies were found just a few yards apart. It was a killing with no apparent motive, a murder without meaning. There was no robbery, no sexual attack. The murder had taken place in broad daylight on a public and well-trodden piece of land, but no one, it seemed, had seen anything that could help the police. Two women walking their dogs, afternoon, mid-afternoon, and for unknown reason, they are killed. The motive is not apparent at this stage. The police investigation began with the intensive, routine chore of house-to-house -house inquiries in the neighborhood. 25,000 questionnaires were completed. 
1,500 phone calls and 2,500 statements were processed by the incident room. Detectives even travelled to the Falklands to talk to members of the departed task force. This was the police strategy to crack the Aldershot double murder. They appealed to anyone who had been on the common at the crucial time to come forward. Anyone they later discovered to have been here who hadn't come forward would be automatically suspect. There were problems with this approach. Just look at the size of this heath. It's a vast area. Any number of people might have been here quite innocently, but not heard the police appeal to come forward. But the police had very little to go on. No weapon was ever found, no motive was ever identified. No one saw anyone dressed in clothes which must have been soaked in blood. And as far as we know, there was nothing found at the scene of the crime to help identify the killer. But they did have that anonymous phone call the day after the murder. And the following night, again after the pubs closed, Fell was back in the phone box. Look, I know, I know where the man who did the killings lives. Now, my brother called you yesterday. His name is Pete. He lives at 10 York Road. But unbelievably, it was almost a fortnight before detectives following up the two drunken calls made contact with Peter Fell. When they did, they quickly eliminated him from their inquiries. They didn't realize that Fell himself had made them. He had already been seen by officers on their routine house-to-house -house inquiries. Fell had told them that on the day of the murder, he'd been in the pub till half past two before walking to his job as a door-to-door -door photographic salesman at half past three. That was enough to satisfy the CID he was alibied at three o'clock. Sir, we are quite happy with Fell. Verified at work at 15.30 hours. Cannot verify pub hours. Meanwhile, the police had staged a reconstruction on the common. The exercise seemed to vindicate the police strategy. There seemed to be one man who had been seen, but who hadn't come forward. Descriptions varied, but he was said to be wearing a greenish or combat jacket. One apparently reliable witness, a military policeman jogging on the common, helped draw up a photo fit of that missing man. It bore more than a passing resemblance to Peter Fell. But in spite of the phone calls and the photo fit likeness, no one seemed to take Fell seriously as a murder suspect. <laughs> Good morning, this is Dave Luck. You're listening to 2CR for Dorset and Hampshire. Well, it hardly seems possible that a year has gone by since our troops set sail on the QE2 for the Falklands. Amazing. Here's Roxy Music. A year of fruitless investigations had gone by. The murder inquiry was winding down. Peter Fell was now married. He'd gone to live in Bournemouth after getting on the wrong bus from Aldershot. By the first anniversary of the murders, jobless and with his wife pregnant, Fell again succumbed to the familiar comfort of drink. Well, on the day following the murder, we did receive an anonymous telephone call from someone who said that they'd overheard a man in a public house, and we can only assume Aldershot or perhaps Farnham, we look into this anniversary to try and jog that person's memory, and this man we are very keen to trace. And finally, he gave in to another familiar temptation. Uh, I know who did Bournemouth, uh, the Aldershot murders. Aldershot, double murders, May 10th, 1978. We have the recording of this telephone call in which Fell is so drunk he gets the date of the murders wrong by four years. Even now, more than a month was to pass before Fell was finally arrested, some 14 months after his first phone call. 
he was taken back to Aldershot and held in a nearby police station. He was questioned in seven sessions over a period of three days. His repeated requests for a solicitor met with no success. He ate none of the meals he was offered while in the cells. Normally, in a case like this, that's more than 10 years old, there'd be no accurate record of what was said and done during more than nine hours of interviews. But it's one of the remarkable aspects of this case that we do know, because all the interviews were tape recorded by the police, well before legislation was introduced insisting on the taping of interviews. Well, I had to... You're going to take a lot more than that to convince me. Yeah. Do you see what I said to you previously, day, bit by bit, it's piling up against you. And the sooner you start seeing clear my sunshine, the sooner we're going to start talking. After nine hours of interrogation, two conducted tours of the murder site and several crucially unrecorded conversations with officers in his cell, Peter Fell finally made a limited but fatal admission. Without this so-called confession, there'd never have been a case against him. He admitted to having hit one woman with a stick because, apparently, she reminded him of his mother. But within minutes of admitting this, he asked to see the interviewing officers again and told them that what he'd just said was a load of rubbish. Then, on an identity parade, the military policeman who'd seen the missing man while he was out jogging failed to pick out Fell. So Peter Fell, though he'd apparently confessed to the murder and to being a crazed double killer, was released on bail. But the police seemed to have been convinced of Fell's guilt, and three months later, he was rearrested. Mark Keeble was Fell's employer at the time of the murders. They appeared to become more and more convinced that they had uh, found the man, uh, as it were. I think there was one particular officer that uh, felt um, that, he, that he had his man and nothing was going to sway him from that. How did you get that impression? Um, by him directly telling me. The police suspicions were understandable. The photo fits were such a good match for Fell that 11 people apparently phoned the police to say so. And evidence then emerged linking Fell with a lethal weapon. A former flatmate told the police he'd seen Fell with a knife of the type apparently used to carry out the murders. But worst of all, the police found evidence to undermine his story that he'd been at work at half past three. The murder took place here on the common at three o'clock and would certainly have left the killer splashed with blood. Fell said he'd spent the morning at home about a mile away here at 10 York Road. He told the police that after going to one of these pubs at lunchtime, he'd set off for his work at a company called Olin Mills. He said he'd turned up here to be picked up by the studio's minibus at half past three. A perfect alibi because you can't get from the murder site at Hungry Hill, stop off home to change out of blooded clothes and get to Fell's workplace in half an hour. But another of the sales team who was in the minibus that day, Gene Stone, was to prove a critical prosecution witness. So you were able to tell the police that that day things had started at four o'clock, not at half past three? Yes. And when I got to work, the minibus had already taken some of the canvases at half past three and come back to pick us up. And myself and Mrs Bennett started at four o'clock. What about Peter Fell that day? He was late coming. He came about ten minutes after us. And that would have given Fell a vital extra half hour to change out of a murderer's clothes. First time we'd ever seen him dressed like he was. Very smart, in a suit, shirt. His hair was done differently. Completely opposite to what he'd ever been before. There was another explanation for his sudden smartness, but the jury never heard it. We'd had a conversation fairly early on that said, Peter, that you needed to smarten up representing the company, which he was, that, that, that he would need to smarten up because he couldn't go on people's doorsteps and talking about offers and trying to sell anybody anything with that type of appearance. Oh, so you had actually said, Peter, I want you to smart, smarten yourself up? Indeed, yes. Mrs Stone's evidence undermined Fell's original alibi. But by the time of the trial, he had a different and a better one. With his acute drink problem, he couldn't remember what he was doing a couple of days earlier, let alone the 14 months that had gone by since the murders. 
it was classic detective work that uncovered the new alibi. Roy Churcher is a former policeman. Fell's solicitor engaged him to investigate anything his client might have done on the day of the murders. The search was long, but finally fruitful. My principal, Mr Roberts, obtained from Fell a list of the places that he might have been at. And one of the places he said he might have been was at the bank, Barclays Bank. So it was down to me to make these inquiries at these various places, and I went to Barclays Bank. And lo and behold, I found that Fell had been in the bank that day and had cashed two cheques. It now seems certain that on the afternoon of the murders, Peter Fell cashed a cheque at Barclays Bank here in the centre of Aldershot. And the timing of that transaction could have been the end of the case against him. The technology has changed, but the system for cashing a house cheque hasn't, and it gives an accurate timing as the cheque moves through the bank. The cheques are totaled and put through the computer at regular intervals. Fell's cheque for £10 wasn't processed, batched as they call it, by the bank's computer until 3.47 that afternoon, just after the bank closed. The chief cashier on duty that day and the person who cashed Fell's cheque was Shirley Hewer. When do you take your lunch? Um, between 1.30 and 2.30, I always took my lunch. So can we say with any certainty, therefore, that that afternoon cheque must have been passed over the counter between 2.30, when you came back from lunch, mm -hmm. and 3.47? Yes, yes. Well, if you check back to when the previous batch went through, which I believe is, was after 3 o'clock, that cheque was cashed between 3 and 3.30. It made it a stronger alibi, in my view, um, simply because if he had known about this in the first instance, he would perhaps have told the police. He would have come forward and told us. Uh, but he didn't know this. In your personal opinion, what do you think the percentage probability is that Peter Fell cashed that cheque? I believe he cashed it. 100%. 100%? Yeah. Well, that's certain? Yeah. When the jury failed to take up the judge's suggestion and accept his bank alibi, the case was lost for Peter Fell. Right up to the end, we know that he was torn between desire for the national notoriety of being the famous Aldershot double murderer and the fear of serving a life sentence for a crime he adamantly denied committing. We also know that some of the officers principally responsible for bringing him to justice had serious doubts about his guilt. Perhaps they felt that all Peter Fell was guilty of was a fatal tendency to draw attention to himself, something to be pitied rather than punished. Digging back ten years through these files, trial and error has discovered that there was good reason for those doubts. We now know that the trial of Peter Fell was corrupted by error, irregularity, and in the case of one key witness, perjury. One other thing. When the case came to appeal, the then Lord Chief Justice complained that the longer the case went on, the more convinced he was of Fell's guilt. Just what he was to say four years later in rejecting the appeal of the Birmingham Six. You'd never guess. But beneath the mild exterior of Peter Fell lay a man of steel. At 20, he was already a boxing champion for the army. And his courage wasn't confined to the ring. Following his country's call, he'd served in the Falklands, yomping his way to victory amid the flack and crackle of Argentine gunfire. You'd never believe it to look at him. And you'd be right. When he went to the army, he used to say that, uh... He'd been, uh, he'd won trophies in boxing and uh, he'd, um, he'd been to Northern Ireland and Falcons and things like which He'd never been anywhere near, like, you know. So it was things like that. It's, uh, I mean, they were believable. I mean, I, I, th I thought he'd been to Northern Ireland, like, you know. And uh, he, he once brought back a trophy from his boxing, like, but he apparently had got it from um, one of these trophy shops, like, you know, and he got it made up for himself, like, you know, so. Accrington in Lancashire was home to Paul and Peter for much of their early life. 
Their parents' marriage broke up when Peter was three and he went to foster parents. The first set of foster parents couldn't keep him, the second rejected him after 10 years and he ended up in a local children's home. He was short of uh, love, I think, you know. Nobody cared for him or anything like that. He just wanted to be noticed, I think, and look, I'm here, there's nobody taking any notice of me, so I'll invent things, I'll say things and to be noticed, you know, and that's what he did a lot of. A hell of a lot of. But if he went in the army with the same attitude that he showed in the home, I bet he's got himself into a lot of trouble. And he did. His disciplinary record was appalling, and on at least two occasions he made up false stories about being robbed or beaten up by strangers. His final discharge from the army on the 15th of March 1982 was said to be in the interests of the service. Dr. Robin Ilbert had an early insight into the mind of Peter Fell. He was, still is, the prison doctor at Winchester, where Fell was held on remand, awaiting trial for murder. I remember him as being a simple young man uh, who clearly needed, according to the story that he told me, to boost his ego by doing things which any of us do during the course of our young lives, probably, telling whoppers. Uh, but in his case, it seemed to have become almost a survival mechanism. And it seemed to have become, uh, from his own testimony, something which he had used ultimately to his own very great disadvantage. So how would a man like this have reacted to the sustained police interrogation he underwent over three days while he was confined in the cells here, in the charge of Chief Inspector Long, D.S. Searle and D.S. Vincent? We were convinced that the key to this case lay in those tapes. Long hours were spent going over them in fine detail. Have you come to that bit where they talk about the knife? The police asking about the knife? In one or two? I think it's in the first interview. First is uh, DCI Long throughout. Taping of interrogations was in its infancy ten years ago, so it's rare for us to have tapes to go on. Tapes and transcripts, the written record of what's on those tapes. But checking one against the other proved difficult. The tapes add up to something like nine hours or so of crude, scratchy, amateurish recordings. We decided to have them professionally enhanced, so we came here, to this sound studio. We've had these ten-year-old tapes filtered and digitised, and the results have been startling. Listening to them now gives us a window on the bizarre events that were going on at Farnborough Police Station those three days in July 1983. It's a total dialogue of the deaf. They simply can't understand the man they're dealing with. Why, they ask him, did he make those self-incriminating phone calls? What did you do expect? The police car just come screaming around with blue lights and all the rest of it yeah, to yeah. apprehend Peter Fell and take him down to the police station. And the next day, there it will be in the local press, Police swoop, detained man on suspicion of murder. Is that what you wanted? For the first five interviews, lasting a total of seven and a half hours, Fell consistently denies having anything to do with the murder or even being anywhere near the common. I have not murdered nobody. Never have, never will. It's not that I was insane. I haven't murdered nobody. Uh, the phone calls and all that. Observing the thing. It's just like, like I said, to why the other people. And it's just a box for the other. That's only for the way, way to be somewhere. And there's a box and some belt. Just for the way to be somewhere. I think it's probably like phone calls where it's not. I'm nobody. Never will be, never will. That's the only reason I think I did a phone call. What's obvious from listening to the tapes is that this isn't an objective search for the truth. The police seem to have no doubts about Fell's guilt. I didn't kill those people. No, that's not the answer. See, well, I'm saying that. No. I'm, I'm telling you. 
No one's saying that the interviews were conducted with the threat of physical duress, but the sheer relentless weight of the questioning, nine hours of it, over three days with no solicitor present and having refused virtually anything to eat, begins to have its effect. Honestly, the that. What I've said to you just now is really repeated what you've told us prior today. With regards to much yeah, I'm not sure, because it's virtually putting questions in my head. I don't know what's in my head. Let's face it, I'm not trying to do that with that number. No, that's not right. And let's try and sort this out. Fell wants to satisfy the police, but he can't give them what they want. However much, as they admit in this revealing but poorly recorded remark, they try to encourage him. What I'm trying to do is to encourage them in a very situation. The problem is that Fell's memory can't be encouraged. Throughout the first interviews, Fell sticks to his story. He simply wasn't on the common, so he can't oblige the police with memories of the murders. So, after a total of 31 hours under arrest, what do the police do to encourage his memory? They take him to the common. Of course, these trips to the common aren't recorded, so we have no idea what was said. But they happen at a critical time for Fell. Sergeant Searle had told him that if he remembered being on the common, it might help to rule him out as the murderer. On the other hand, as Fell must have known, it might rule him in. And back at the station, the pressure was on again. I have a children with it. There's nothing I can say. There's not a thing I can say to you. I haven't killed nobody. Finally, the admission comes. In the crucial sixth interview, more than two days after he's taken into custody, he finally admits the attack. But when it does come, it's not quite the story they expect. Do you recall hitting this lady? Yeah. With your, you say you, with your fists or you slapped her or something like that? Yeah. The other one, death. Yeah. It's an admission, yes, but an admission that doesn't fit the murder. He says he hit one woman with a stick. No knife, no second woman. But why should an innocent person make even such a limited confession? These tapes seem to offer an unimpeachable record of all that took place between Fell and the officers. Certainly that's what the court must have thought ten years ago. But listening to the nearly ten hours of tape, we stumbled upon a rather strange comment. There's a seventh interview. It took place just a couple of hours after the confession. In it, Fell retracted everything he'd admitted in interview six. And in the middle of this retraction, we found two strange phrases which seemed to refer to something else taking place in the cells. It was then that we realised that the tapes and the transcripts of the interviews don't tell the whole story. Interspersed between the recorded sections, Fell was getting visits in the cells, where the conversations were not recorded. This is the detained persons register on which the policeman responsible for the cells has to write down everything that happens to a prisoner. It even records at regular intervals how the prisoner is sleeping. 
And what it shows us is that in the crucial hours before that vital sixth confession interview, DCI Long spent almost an hour alone in the cell with Fell. Just before trial, Long produced an additional statement acknowledging this visit. They were having, he says, an informal conversation. But look, these 12 lines hardly do justice to the 50 minutes which the register shows that he was in the cell. 50 minutes of properly transcribed interview, by the way, would cover something like 70 pages. Could something have been said to prompt Fell to offer a confession in the very next interview? We think we've found a clue in a conversation that took place just half an hour after Chief Inspector Long's visit to cell number four. Just as they were about to set off for a second visit to the common, Fell and D.S. Searle were alone in the car park. They were talking about the difference between murder and manslaughter. At trial, Searle said he explained that you're only guilty of manslaughter if you're not responsible for your actions. He said it was Fell who brought the subject up. But why? Fell has always claimed that those 50 minutes were spent not on informal conversation, but with Long telling him he had to choose between a charge of murder or manslaughter. And in the very next interview, Fell seems to accept the role of an unbalanced inadequate. He's ready to confess. But when he does offer an explanation, it's almost farcical. He finally says he did it because he lost his senses, the qualification, of course, for the lesser charge of manslaughter. I think you're certain of that they were they lying. And you thought they were lying here. Well, Trey seems to be that, and everybody seems to be that. You, everybody seems to be that. Just get the end of the people out, all over the place. You know, do just want to be laughing. Fell is either guilty or he's not, but has made this calculation that the police have got enough evidence to have him put away. So if he's going to get convicted, it might as well be for manslaughter on the grounds of some kind of diminished responsibility. So the tapes may not tell the whole story. And late nights in the office led to another discovery. In a properly conducted interview, the time the interview starts and stops is recorded by one of the officers on the tape. Take this, the first interview, DCI Long refers to it beginning at 1.25, and at the end he records the time as being 4 o'clock. That's 155 minutes of interview. We timed it. We listened to all 155 minutes of it. Except that there weren't 155 minutes. It only lasted 144, 11 minutes missing. So we turned straight away to the crucial sixth interview, only to find that it too was short. Again, it's precisely timed at 1 hour and 12 minutes, but it isn't. It's three minutes short. Five of the seven interviews came up short. Of course, there may be a simple explanation. We don't have access to the original tapes. These cassettes are just copies. But look at the end of interview two. As we can see from the transcript, the tape simply runs out. We've timed the tape and it runs for 59 minutes. But the actual interview is logged as taking 75 minutes. When it comes to this sworn police statement, those extra 16 minutes are accounted for by just 25 words. You said to me there were two dogs. Do you believe one was running loose? For 10 years, no one has thought to check the tapes in this detail for one very simple reason. There's, apparently, an independent check on their accuracy. It's this transcript, referred to by the woman who typed it as a verbatim record. It's a vital document. The jury took it with them when they retired to consider their verdict. It would be quite normal and proper for the police to copy, as they seem to have done, the transcript into their own sworn statements of the interviews. But one night, poring over the paperwork, we spotted something rather odd. 
In fact, it's the other way round. The transcript, however accurate or complete it may be, is copied from the police statements. We'd noticed these two words standing out in the middle of the transcript of the confession interview. They seemed completely meaningless. Then we thought to look up DCI Long's statement, his version of the interviews. It contains not just the dialogue, but some extra information, for instance what photographs and exhibits were being shown to Peter Fell. Now see what happens when we merge in the transcript of this bit of the interview. It's almost exactly the same. All those extra bits have simply been blanked out before copying, but in this case they missed those two vital words, the clue that the transcript is copied from the statements and not the other way round. Well, this isn't a simple technicality. If the supposedly independent transcript of the tapes is a second-hand version, and a second-hand version of a police statement, then the integrity of the whole process is inevitably compromised. And it's not hard to discover instances where the tapes, the statements and the truth appear to clash. Remember this picture which Fell had taken to inflate himself when he arrived in Aldershot. For once, this mixture of vanity and insecurity might have done him some good. We know it was taken on the 10th of April, just 30 days before the murders. His hair can only be described as short. Brian Hackney, the military policeman jogging on the common, got no more than a fleeting glimpse of the man who never came forward to be eliminated but Mr Hackney was able to help the police produce this photo fit. Then, a few days later, he amended it slightly. Photo fit is a very imperfect technique for manufacturing a likeness of a suspect. The police's own research suggests that 45% of all photo fits made in the course of inquiries bear little or no resemblance to the suspect who is eventually apprehended for the crime. When we just pass somebody casually, uh, when we're out for a walk or for a run, very little specific information is retained. What one retains is what we call a type likeness, a general impression of the face. But of course, when you make up a photo fit, the whole system is built around constructing a total face. So if you haven't remembered very much about the eyes or the nose or the mouth, you've still got to produce something. And under those circumstances, you fall back on what is plausible, what is average, and inevitably, error will creep in. Research suggests that hair is the single most dominant feature, that if you're going to remember anything, it's going to be something about the hair. I cannot see quite clearly... The length of the Robert Olding is a hair specialist, a former chairman of the Institute of Trichology. His report for trial and error casts severe doubt on the photofits being likenesses of fell. Well, this one, of course, it would be quite impossible. There's no way he could have grown that amount of side hair with this thick... I think I'd describe it as a, a wadgy hairstyle. This one, a little nearer, but again, he would have had to have grown too much hair. You'd have to be looking at hair roots that will be capable of churning out hair at least uh, at a rate of two inches a month, which I've never come across yet in all the years I've been in practice. That's <laughs> unknown to trichological science. <laughs> Indeed, yes, mm. yes. We arranged for a special prison visit for a barber to cut Fell's hair. His task was to cut it to an exact match with that photograph taken a month before the murders. We then returned exactly 30 days later to see how long it would have grown by the day of the murders. And this was the result. Now compare this real picture with the photo fit given at the time. On the basis of the most memorable feature, the hair, it just can't be Fell. But Peter Fell wasn't the only person who looked like the missing man on the common. In June 1981, a year before the murders, Christine White had a most disturbing experience in some nearby woods. She'd gone there, as she regularly did, to walk her dogs. And, uh, we drove down to just about there, parked the car, and uh, my boyfriend said he needed to spend a penny. He would, he would just uh, pop into the bushes. Yeah. As we got out of the car, I saw this chap walking along the main pathway over there, and I could see him watching me. He'd walked past and he came back and he started coming towards me. Jamie, the dog, uh, he sensed there was something strange about him as well and 
he ran up to him barking. It was a big dog, a big retriever, and uh, the chap didn't take any notice. He just patted him on his head and carried on towards me. The man wasn't afraid of the dog no, at all? Not no. at all. And I did sense, I've, I've wondered whether he had something in his hand at that stage. I didn't know. It was very frightening. So I had changed my um, direction down this way. He followed straight away. I started at running and I called for Pete. The next thing I knew, with this chap tearing after me, Pete came round the corner, we all fell into a heap together. This chap um, brushed himself down and ran off. We got the dogs into the car, went home and phoned the police immediately to report this incident. So it, was, it was so upsetting at the time. Now, there was a sequel to this, wasn't there, about a year later? Oh, that's right, that. yes. Um, I, was, uh, I was a stewardess at the time and I was just going on a flight and the, the uh, free local paper came, came in the door and on the front page was this big photo fit picture of the chap. And in my mind, I was absolutely positive it was the same chap that chased me. So I put it in the kitchen. Pete had come in, seen it immediately, phoned the police and said, this is the same chap that followed us. So you're both independently, utterly convinced completely. that the photo fits that you saw were the same as the man who tried a to attack you on the Absolutely day. positive. Like I say, he phoned the police. He didn't even wait to hear from me. What was the police's reaction to this? Well, not much really, to be honest. The existence of this vital evidence, which could have been so helpful to the defence, was not disclosed by the police. Vital because we know that the man who chased Christine White could not have been Fell. Private Fell was on duty in Germany at the time with the army. Of all the causes and weapons of murder, Stabbing is the most frequent, knives the most commonly used. This lethal cutlery comes in all shapes and sizes. It was the police's early task to try to find a knife that would fit the 16 stab wounds inflicted on the victims of the Aldershot common murders. We took the case to one of the country's leading forensic pathologists. Examination of the photographs and examination of the original post-mortem report indicates that they were caused by a double-edged knife almost certainly a, a double-edged knife of either the Fairburn Sykes type or a relatively close copy. The Fairburn Sykes knife is like this, a double-edged dagger type knife, the sharp edge is going up to a hilt, a relatively robust sharp edged blade. It's a military knife and its function is to stab. It has no civilian uses? There's no civilian use, no. It's designed to kill. Would you estimate that the police would be specifically interested in reports of anyone known to possess a double-edged knife of this sort? Yes, I would have thought that uh, the original pathologist would have advised in that respect after the post-mortem examination. At the time of the murder, Fell lived in flat four here at 10 York Road. John Harper in flat three was the closest thing he had to a friend. His evidence was to prove disastrous for Fell. Harper first told the police that he thought Fell used to own a knife, but he'd never seen it. Then later, Harper made another statement, and this one was really damning. He said he had, after all, seen Fell with a knife, and when the police took him to a knife shop, he picked out a double-edged weapon. He made a drawing of a knife which looks exactly like a Fairbairn Sykes. It fitted the wounds, it fitted Fell. It's a time of John Harper's life that's now well in the past, but we have found that when he made that damaging second statement, he had other things on his mind. He was being held on remand in a bail hostel awaiting trial. We felt it was important to talk to John Harper. But first, we had to find him. Ten years on, it wasn't easy. The trail in Aldershot had grown cold. But eventually, one night we traced him to a dim town in the flat Thames estuary land of Essex, a place called Greys. We already knew that he'd started a new life. We knew it would be difficult for him to go back to those Aldershot days. When the police came again on, on, on June the 28th, um, your statement's different, and you say, I did see the knife. I saw that knife. And you refer to the knife having fallen out of a kit bag that that Fell was, was unpacking. 
Do you remember saying that to the police? Yes. I said that the third of maybe the third interview when they came back was yes, I saw it. I could generally describe it. Why didn't you mention that in the first place? And basically, I said because I didn't want to get involved in the murder case. As far as I was concerned, nothing to do with me. But had you in fact seen a knife? No, I hadn't, because they've been pressurising me. You're saying that you had not seen. Felt I had with not a knife. seen the knife. And why did you tell the police you had? Because they were pressurising, pressurising me, saying that you're doing. Next, no, we know you've seen it. You must have seen it. And it was they're getting quite heavy. And as I was a lot younger then, I I gave in. Do you remember making that that picture? Yes, I do. That's my handwriting, so I should want it. And, and where, did, where did that come from, if you hadn't seen the knife? John, is, were you drawing a knife, the sort of knife that you thought would satisfy the police, as it were? The sort of thing the police, you thought the police were looking for? Yes, I was. You knew about army combat knives, didn't you, anyway? Because, I mean, you, you used to be in the Territorial Army at the time, didn't you? I had made assumptions about army knives, yeah. Yeah. So, um, is, this, is this... Are you familiar with that knife? Is that the sort of knife you were trying to, trying to describe? Yes, it was. But the knife that I've shown you, and the knife you tried to describe to the police, you never saw fell having that sort of knife or anything like it at all? No. Now, at the trial, you said, I saw the knife, I picked it up, there's no doubt about it. Why did you say that at trial? Because that was in statements and I thought, well, I said in statements, I'd have to reiterate at the trial. You felt there was no going back? Yes. How do you feel about that now? What can one say? Peter was consistent and adamant that he had not done these two things. And I mean, my recollection of that is, is helped by rereading the report that I wrote for his trial at that time. Were you impressed by this consistency, speaking personally? I was impressed by it, yes, uh, to the extent of having to say to myself, not to him, I believe this is the case. If a man like Fell came to you today, how would you try to progress things differently? I would certainly wish the services of the clinical psychologists who know about this, up to and including perhaps Dr. Goodjohnson himself from the Maudsley Hospital, to be involved and to submit, as is perfectly right, a clinical psychological profile, separate from my own medical and psychiatric report on this man. That is what I'd do. So we commissioned the report that Dr. Ilbert couldn't because he didn't then know it was possible. We asked Dr. Gisley Good Johnson, a forensic psychologist who specialises in confessions, to examine the case of Peter Fell. His conclusions cast serious doubts on the conviction. It is my view that at the time of his interrogation in 1983, Mr. Fell was a psychologically vulnerable individual who would have benefited greatly from the advice and support of a solicitor. Having studied this case in some detail, I have serious doubts about the reliability of Mr. Fell's self-incriminating admissions to the police in 1983. There was a man here on the common that day in 1982, and he was a killer. But that man was not Peter Fell. All Peter Fell's guilty of is a sad attempt to draw attention to himself. The rest of the case against him is built upon the lies about the knife the doubtful circumstances of his interrogation 
and identification evidence which, if anything, rules him out as the murderer. In his 12th year in prison, he continues to protest his innocence. I never felt he was guilty. I don't feel it today. Uh, I got quite a lot of experience in investigating criminal cases, both in the police force and since I left the police force. I've never come across a case like this before where I felt so strongly about a man's innocence.